Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to today's session in the ReadyTalk webinar series. Uh, thank you for joining us. If this is your first time, welcome. Um, if you've joined us before for another event in our series, welcome back, and we really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to do so. Today's seminar is entitled, The One-Two Punch of Effective Lead Engagement, Accurate Lists and Powerful Content. And we've got Brian Carroll, the Executive Director of Revenue um, Optimizations at Mech Labs, joining us today to share some insight on the topic. Um, again, he is the Executive Director at Mech Labs there and the CEO of InTouch, which is also part of the Mech Labs group, um, author and bestseller of the book Lead Generation for the Complex Sale. Um, an expert in lead nurturing, has presented a number of webinars, so uh, we know that you'll take some good action items out of today's presentation. A couple of housekeeping items before we do get started today. During the presentation, all the participants are going to be in a listen-only mode. However, if you guys do have some questions, please feel free to chat those in at any time during the presentation in that chat box that's at the lower left-hand portion of your screen. And we'll be sure to queue those up for Brian then at the end during the Q&A portion. I'm um, going to go back here to this Twitter slide really quick. If you guys have comments or questions, feel, sure to, feel free to carry those on, excuse me, on uh, the social side over on Twitter with the hashtag SherpaWebinar. And we've got all of, all of the uh, speaker Twitter handles there as well. As a reminder, today's event is being recorded Wednesday, August 8th. And you guys will all receive a link to the recording um, in the post-event email along with a PDF of the slides presented by Ryan today. So on that note, I will go ahead and hand it off to Brian to kick off today's call. Thank you, Simone. Well, I'm so glad to be with all of you today. Uh, I can't see you, but I know that we have people joining us from, from across the world in different time zones. And you know, we are going to talk about uh, a one-two punch to effective lead engagement. And what I thought would be helpful is just give you a little bit of background quickly on, on Mech Labs and, and myself so that you understand uh, why we are thinking what we do, and, and really the basis to the recommendations and what we are going to be teaching you today. You know, my goal ultimately is to equip you. Um, I'm here to help you. And I, I want to invite you during uh, today's session, I really want this to be interactive. So as you have questions that come up, um, go ahead and put them into the chat. I'll be monitoring those. And if I can answer them in real time during the presentation, I'd like to do that. We're also going to save time for Q&A. So let's um, go ahead and just uh, introduce Mech Labs. So um, some of you are, are familiar with Mech Labs. Some of you are, are more familiar with our, our brands, uh, Marketing Sherpa and Marketing Experiments. But what I'm sharing with you today is really based on more than 10 years of research we've done. And Mech Labs is really focused on discovering what really works in marketing to help executives optimize the financial performance of their sales and marketing funnel. And so we've conducted more than 10 years of research. We've conducted 1,300 major experiments. Um, our work had, has been run on tests that have affected over a billion emails. We've uh, tested and optimized over 10,000 sales paths. And um, uh, this year we're, we're publishing uh, hundreds of publications, and uh, we're conducting uh, many conferences uh, here, here in the U.S. as well as uh, webinars around the world. So, what I wanted to do is just give you a little background of me. I, I joined the company in 2008. Um, I've really grown up focused on uh, really working with companies that have a complex sale. And so we, we don't have a lot of time to get into the history. I want to drive, dive into the content. But I, I just want to uh, say that um, I, I can't see all of you today. Some of you are attending as a team in a conference room. Some of you are attending at a desk or working from home is that uh, the, the whole goal today is um, not for me to just share with you concepts, but really to give you some tangible ideas. So again, if you have questions, let me know. Here's the problem that we're, uh, we're here to solve today. Uh, I want to talk to you about lead nurturing, because when you develop lead generation programs, and we talked about what's our goal, effective lead engagement, um, what I find is, is that so many leads that are generated by marketers get lost, ignored, and discarded. And in fact, what our research has shown is 80% of marketing generated leads are lost, ignored, or discarded. There's a lot of reasons why. Um, our B2B benchmark report, we surveyed uh, here uh, 1,900 marketers, and we found that 80% we've actually surveyed uh, year over year about uh, 32,000 marketers. What we found is, is that 80% of B2B marketers pass raw leads to sales. 
So one of the reasons why most leads aren't converting is that they aren't ready to engage to a salesperson. And the challenge is, is for salespeople today, especially in this economy, is that they're focused on who is going to buy in one to two quarters. So there's this gap. We're giving leads too early. Many marketers are passing leads to salespeople without qualification or the necessary data. And these longer term leads, these future opportunities often ignored by salespeople, represent approximately 77% of your potential revenue. And what's interesting is, is that we studied lead nurturing how many marketers are doing it. And what we found is 73% of companies have no process to re-engage leads to nurture them after they've handed off to sales. So what's this mean to you? Um, what, what this means, and, and what I'm hoping to solve with you today, is that if you can relate to any of these things, and if your magnitude of your problem is just a fraction of this, it's still costing you money. If you think about your marketing funnel and your sales funnel, um, really, I want you to begin thinking of yourself today more like a revenue plumber. And your goal as you look at your pipeline is understand where the leaks are and where you can plug the leaks. We found that the leaks are happening in two areas, not having clarity on the lead, and two, not having clarity on how to nurture the process. And so that's what I'm going to teach you today. I thought it would be helpful to begin with a case study. And I, I wanted to give you this, uh, this case study as an example of a company doing a simple lead nurturing program just to talk about the power of what could happen if they re-engage the leads they already have. And here's, here's the thing. You guys, right now, um, many of you are on fiscal year. So we are in the midst of third quarter. A lot of you are B2B marketers who have a complex sale. We also have some business consumer marketers on today. But generally speaking, for considered purchases, um, the leads you generating right now this month may or may not impact 2012's revenue. I find that most of the time when we study sales cycles, what makes a complex sale, the leads you generate this month may actually impact January of 2013. So what can you do to move the sales needle? And this is what one company looked at, in, and I'd like to encourage you, if you don't have a lead re-engagement process, the fastest way I find to get ROI is to go further with the names you already have. And so that's what this group is doing. They're a B2B company with a short sales cycle. They were focusing on launching an email series, and this is a test protocol 31985. Their goal was to invigorate leads that have passed a 30-day window, which most clients are likely to convert. And some of you have attended other web clinics that I've done. Um, I, I recognize uh, someone who's attending today's webinar. I did an event with David. David and I did uh, uh, a webinar today, hello to you David, where, where he was showing the velocity or follow-up increase in conversion. So they focused on leads that were beyond a 30-day window. And the question was, is what tactics could be implemented to re-engage existing leads and ultimately uh, turn those leads from uh, typically being lost or discarded to recapture and drive revenue. So here's what happened. I, I just want to set up and say, here's the result, and then I'll spend some time telling you how to. What they found as a result of addressing the leads they already had is that 37% of their customers, of their closed sales, were from leads generated over three months ago. That's significant. Think about it. A th over a third of the revenue was from leads that were older than a month. Now, if, if you focus just on engaging leads right now that became converted, gave to your sales team in 30 days and followed the, the common logic, in this case, this company would have been losing a lot of revenue. And over 20% of their revenue was from leads generated over one year ago. So the takeaway here is that you do need to focus on fresh, relevant leads, the ones you're generating right now, but don't neglect the ones that are three or, month, uh, three or more months ago. And so what I want to teach you is this concept of re-engagement, and these are the steps that they went through. And we'll, we'll get more in the tactical how-to. The first thing this company did is that they focused on leads generated through content downloads, and they identified specific topics or themes. Lead generation at its core is about building a relationship, and you want to keep the conversation going. Um, 
And so what they looked at is where that conversation started and what the topics were to keep that conversation going. The focus of nurturing or re-engagement is to progress. Most leads aren't ready to talk to a salesperson right away. So they identified uh, four key topics. And what they did is they developed uh, an email series that was weekly, a week one. And then they did a pass for week two and a pass for uh, having a call to action. And the call to action was straightforward. This was a two-week process to have a call to action to sign up for an online software demo. So this company uh, sold software as a service. And what they then did is based on what people did is if they signed up for an online software demo, then they were moved over into either being a sales ready lead, that they were ready to engage the team. They determined this based on a universal lead definition. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But then those that weren't ready, they moved into lead re-engagement. And what I want to spend time is uh, those leads that moved to re-engagement, the ones that didn't convert in that first 30-day window, this is the process they went through. If leads finished the initial nurturing series without converting, the initial two-week nurturing series, the team sends two other types of email to the audience. The first thing they did is they put together a monthly email newsletter. This included short columns from the, the CEO as well as information from industry events and book reviews. But the goal was is this was designed around topics they knew were relevant from their audience. The, the other thing they did is they set up a, a second type of email which was uh, that they set up a monthly webinar invitation. So you guys are all attending a webinar here sponsored by ReadyTalk. Um, what they did is they uh, sent out a monthly webinar invitation, the term webinar in the subject line. They, they personally addressed it. They described the event. And the goal here is that they gave people the opportunity to manage their subscription of what path they're in from a nurturing standpoint. Their um, email management and marketing automation system software allowed them to do it. The, the third step they did is in addition to the newsletter and webinar invites, uh, they had a bi-weekly email series. And what this was is they focused on marketing tips and practical information for uh, leads that were older. And so this series happened shortly after that. What the goal was, it was mainly to keep in contact with this audience sharing articles they felt would be relevant. The difference here between the other two is they, there was not a strong call to action. So that was de-emphasized as opposed to focusing on the demo. And um, they also set up in, in terms of the, the program itself uh, an email tip series. And what this was, what I thought was interesting is they had a proactive option to opt out. The, the danger when you're sending out regular email communications to your audience is you don't always know what's relevant. The other thing is, is you may be sharing things that's relevant to people, but the timing's off. So you need to connect relevancy and timing with, with your audience. And what, what I thought was very interesting is they proactively a lot, they went above and beyond that audience. And so you can see here, keep, me, keep the marketing tips coming or I'd rather not receive your marketing tips. And um, by doing this, their objective was to keep this audience from emotionally unsubscribing. So um, the, the takeaway is that you want to avoid overwhelming your audience. And so as you think about doing something simple, this was a pure email-based program. And I found right now, if you're going to do lead re-engagement, one of the tactics or channels you, uh, that most companies are employing today is email. It's a great way of doing it, but you want to avoid overwhelming your audience. So um, in this case, they, they did a couple of things. They worked with their sales team to stop emailing sales ready leads that had uh, scheduled a product demo because they had a separate stream of emails that their sales team was working on. And then what they also did is after um, someone filled out a download and that they um, that they didn't engage, that they didn't move to being sales ready, uh, they would allow people to start the process over, but that any leads in long-term series that filled up the form to download more content, they were taken out of the long-term series. So if someone responded to the call to action the down of the demo, the objective ultimately for them as they looked at their sales path is customers who download software typically are more developed in their need than those who haven't. And that's where they put them in a different nurturing path. 
So what I want to do you guys is this is a case study. We are going to get more into principles, but the, the key takeaway here is this. If you don't have a nurturing process in place, I would encourage you to look at re-engagement as one of the things that could give you a lift this year. And um, this is one of the fastest ways I know to drive ROI because what you are doing is you are going further with the budget you have already spent. So I know you are going to have questions, and uh, I am going to spend some time just quickly giving you a definition. We have talked about lead re-engagement lead nurturing. We haven't defined it yet. And um, what, I, what I want to do is, is as you have questions, again, put those into the chat, and I will look to address them. But let's say what is lead nurturing? Lead nurturing is a relevant and consistent dialogue with viable potential customers regardless of their timing to buy. And uh, the goal of nurturing is this, is that you are um, really focused on progressing people from early interest to consideration. That's really the objective of nurturing. You have to have clarity though, to at what am I nurturing people to? To what stage? And what I find there's a lot of confusion with marketers is they think they're doing nurturing, but they aren't clear about the destination. To what point? I would like to say the first objective, at least if, if you look at this from a lead generation perspective, is you're looking to nurture people until they reach this point of being sales ready. And so what I w want you to understand is that um, you're really looking with the nurturing process to develop an approach so that as you think of your marketing and sales, right now you'll notice that the marketing pipeline and the sales pipeline are separate. I'm just showing this for illustration. Really, they're all connected. From a customer point of view, they don't see things from a marketing or sales pipeline. What they see is, is they're looking at a conversation and they're trying to understand how, um, what am I searching for? How are my needs going to be met? How can I get my questions answered? But what's happening here is you notice there's a step called inquiries. And what I'm talking about is inserting a step called nurturing. And as opposed to handing off leads here as being sales ready, and I'm going to just make a note so you can see this, is that um, we're adding the nurturing step here because our goal is to get clarity at what point do we make the handoff process take place. Um, I was pleased. You know, some of you are watching the, the Olympics um, right now. I wasn't able to tune into the 4x100 relay. What was really great is, um, I don't know if many of you remember the, the previous Olympics, in the 4x100 relay, the men and women's team were both supposed to win the gold medal. They were heavily favored. And guess what happened? They, both teams, didn't even finish the medal round. They didn't even qualify. Why? They dropped the baton. Um, this year, the, the, the women actually beat the world record and they won the gold medal. And um, what I want to say is, is that you've got to get clarity of when you hand things off because it doesn't matter if you have the best team in the world, the best marketing in the world. If you drop the baton, um, you're not going to win. And so you need to be clear on when you're going to hand that off. And this is going to help set the stage for the steps we're going to talk about today. There's four key steps that I want to teach you so that you can um, optimize your lead process and drive more effective lead uh, engagement. And we're going to go rapidly through a lot of content today. Again, I can't see you. If, if I could, I'd be looking at your eyes to say, are you tracking? Is this making sense to you? So how am I doing so far? I'd just like to see some of the comments uh, from those of you attending. Any, any questions so far? Okay. Um, Kent brings up an observation. I see marketing coach confusion about nurturing. Some place it in the pre-conversion stages. Other place it in post-conversion and post-sale stages. It seems like apples and oranges to me. That is, uh, that's a good observation. And what I would say, Kent, is that nurturing is a process that can be applied in, in both post-sale as well as pre-sale um, conditions. Nurturing uh, really can be called account development when someone's a customer. It applies there. There is confusion. And I think the biggest thing is, is uh, as Stephen Covey talks about, is you need to be clear to what your objective is of why you're nurturing. So begin with the end in mind. And uh, Jocelyn asked a question, will the slide deck and audio be available? Yes. 
Um, this is going to be, we're going to make the slides available via PDF for everyone. So you don't need to, if you're scribbling lots of notes, I want to let you know you'll have the deck to go to as a reference. But there's going to be some things I'm going to be bringing up in a moment that I'll tell you to write them down because they're not going to be in my slides. And it sounds like we're, we're, doing, um, we're doing good. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you guys are giving feedback. So here's the four key steps. We're going to talk about the database, how to design a content library, how to measure and tweak, and then cycle this process back. So the first thing is, is I, I want to say the, to optimize the process, you need to have a foundational database. And to do that, to build your nurturing database, I find that a lot of marketers don't have uh, the CRM or the marketing automation tool to do it. Some of you may have lots of data sitting in various Excel spreadsheets. You may have webinar attendees in one area. You might have um, trade shows in another. You may have downloads coming to a form that sits in an email box. What you need to do is you need to bring all these things into one place, all your nurturing list sources from your sales team, past event attendees, newsletter subscribers, so you can begin understanding who's there. And um, in bringing this all into one place, those that do have a more advanced process, you're, you're well ahead already because you can begin looking at your data in a way. And here's the things that you need to be looking for. Um, the, the thing that I found is, is that with your lead nurturing process, bringing all your data in one spot allows you to do an analysis to understand who's in your database, what are the titles in there? And, and I'm going to encourage you to look at doing a regression analysis. In simple terms, it's looking at your data to understand what's there. Who are the titles? Where are your inquiry sources coming from? That gives you clues about how to keep that conversation going. What, what campaign or call to action do they respond to? And um, what you need to be doing with your database is that you need to apply on top of that two things, an ideal customer profile and a universal lead definition. The difference between the two is this, and we're not going to talk about ideal customer profile. Um, I'll give you a web address you can go to, and we actually have a how-to guide for that. I want to spend time on looking at your, your database, and here's some things to know. Um, marketing doesn't need sales to accept leads. What what you do need to do is as you bring things to the database is you need to get clarity and confirm with your sales team when a lead has met your universal lead definition that's agreed upon. And I'm going to spend some time um, teaching you how to create a universal lead definition. Why is this important? When I wrote my book in 2006, it was published, and uh, it's, it's still selling across the world, being translated into Russian, I was informed is that uh, one of the key ideas in our research showed is 90% of companies don't have a universal lead definition. Since my book's been published and there's been um, a lot of other companies talking about this, we've improved a lot. Right now I'm still seeing about 60% of marketers don't have a universal lead definition. And what is it? The, the key thing here is you need to have clarity on what makes a good lead. Um, we won't have time to go through all these questions but the, the idea here is this, is you need to get your sales team and marketing team together to get clarity on what makes a good lead. These are some of the questions you're going to want to ask. And um, I'm going to give you a web address. You can go to the B2B Lead Roundtable. You can have access to an agenda. And I find in about an hour or two hours, sales and marketing sitting down, you have the right people in, with sales. You have the right people in marketing. You can do uh, a webinar session. You can have everyone in the room. However you do it, get everyone together to develop a service level agreement on what exactly the word lead means. And the, the, the biggest question you're trying to answer is this. And this isn't in the questions. This is something you're going to write, want to write down. For us to be 100% certain when we develop a lead and hand it off to you as the sales person, what are the must-have questions that you need to have answered for us to know that you will act on this lead and provide feedback 100% of the time? That is the question. I could repeat it, but I will repeat it in an abridged way. For us to be 100% certain when we give you, the salesperson, a lead, that you will act upon it and provide feedback 100% of the time what are the must-have questions you need answered? 
That is a very important question because what you're coming down to is this, is your goal with lead generation ultimately is to help the sales team sell. You want to handle leads on that are actionable. And when you get clarity in this definition, it tells you when you're going to hold leads back and nurture. So your goal is to nurture leads until they reach that point. Um, you need to get clarity in this question before you implement lead scoring. Lead scoring will not replace the human touch. It's going to help you prioritize that. But these are some of the questions you're going to want to get answered. What information is required to qualify a lead being sales ready? These are follow-up questions. Again, we won't have time to go through them today. You're going to get a copy of the deck, so you'll have these. Um, and what your goal is is this. Use the ULD to delineate sales ready leads from nurture leads. And uh, what, what I want to make sure is that uh, you're clear is that you're only then supposed to, um, to do this is get clear on developing a universal lead definition of what a sales ready lead is so that you can send leads to your team that they can act on, your nurturing leads that get to that point, and what you can prevent happening is having your valuable leads, these relationships you started, getting lost, ignored, or discarded. So this is really foundational because it's going to drive your database. You're building two things, a database to nurture, and then you're building a, a, a framework of when are we going to hand things from marketing to sales. Um, a gap that I find a lot of people face is designing, um, I want to nurture, I just don't know what to say, or I don't have the content to share it. Right now um, you'll see phrases of content marketing, or you'll hear inbound marketing. Both of them are really talking about we're using content as a valid business reason. And the big struggle for salespeople is this. They probably have leads in their database right now, and sales training has taught salespeople to follow up. The problem is, is sales training hasn't taught people how to have relevant follow-up. And this is a big struggle for salespeople is they don't want to just call to touch base or call to check in. To the customer, it's just basically saying, are you ready to buy yet? So what you want to do with your content is your goal is to understand what's relevant to your audience and, and how you can connect the dots with that. And what, when you design your content library and you're doing lead nurturing, here's two things just to keep, um, keep in mind. Again, we're looking to do two things. Build the business case why do lead nurturing and how to. Um, companies that nurture have a double ratio. They have uh, double the amount of wins on nurtured leads versus leads that aren't. And the other thing that's really interesting is this was data that had been published by Demandgen Report, is nurtured leads delivered a 47% higher average sale value, a higher average order value. Um, we just published our Lead Generation Benchmark Report at Marketing Sherpa, and we found that companies that do lead generation and then they add lead nurturing to the process drive a 45% higher return on marketing investment than those companies that just focus on generating leads. So when you get your content library uh, put together, uh, I want to share with you some tactics of how to go about doing that. The first thing you need to do is you need to understand the personas involved in the process. I encourage you to sit down with your sales team. If you aren't clear on this, uh, you need to look at who typically are the main drivers of our customers' buying process. These are some of the examples. It could be a project leader, a CIO. It could be a contact center leader. It could be field service center staff. There is executive sponsors. You need to be clear. And if, if you um, are unsure where to focus, I would encourage you to focus on who the key driver is in the buying process. Sometimes that's, that's going to be a champion. Other times it's going to be uh, the economic buyer. It's going to be one or both. And I want to have you start simple. If you haven't done this, start with one persona. And what a persona is, is it's helping you understand the profile, who the people are that are typically interested and engaged in, in initiating the buying process or doing the research. So you want to understand those key stakeholders. This is a simple approach that um, one company put together and uh, this is uh, a research partner we worked with. We put together a very simple plan, Three Contacts Deep, uh, where we saw the main drivers for them actually was the IT director. But we needed to uh, uh, also add 
two other personas, the CIO who was the economic buyer, the IT director was the champion, and the IT manager was the influencer in the process. Where, where would you begin? Well, if the, the main driver and champion in this case, and their database showed that most of their titles that were engaged in their content was IT directors, that's where we focused our energy. We added the other personas later. And as you think about the process of your content library, you need to understand who's in your database. You need to understand what they're engaging because this is going to help you understand what content is likely to be relevant. And from that, uh, there's a lot of choices you have with your nurturing content library. Um, as you think about your content, there's four main channels you can share your content. The phone, doing events, doing things online, and via email. These are some of the examples of content related to those channels that you could share. Um, you could print this slide out and use it as a way to brainstorm as you look at your process. I want to give you an example though because again, I said that the answer or the question a lot of people have is, where do I find this content? How do we go about that process? Well, the first thing I would say is this. Number one, repurpose. Too many companies feel that they need to create new stuff when you already have content that's inside your organization. Start by leveraging your internal experts. How can you harness the knowledge that exists already in your company? Create a process to capture the expertise and share it, and develop your own thought leaders. The, the other thing we found in, in what many leading companies are doing is they're gathering and filtering relevant content based on message mapping. Message mapping is understanding the personas and the theme. What, what is the, the typical question someone's asking the buying process so that we can provide content that answers those questions, and, and then using that to filter the third-party content. I want to show you an example of repurposing. And, and this is just taking this idea of how can I take what I have and extend it. This is an example uh, of a research chart. This research chart that was done to um, compile data and learn something could be repurposed in a lot of different ways. That research could be shared in a webinar. That webinar could be turned into a, a, a video clip. That video clip could be turned into a tactical download. Or that research chart could become a blog post, and then that blog post could be shared via an email with a link. So this is taking one simple content piece and being able to expand it multiple different ways. And as you look at your personas and how your audience is engaging your content, and we'll spend a little bit of time talking about messaging, the idea here is that you take your quality content. And if you don't know right now, I encourage you to sit down with your team or yourself of doing an inventory of your content portfolio. What do you have that is valuable? Um, so any questions that you guys have, let me know around this area. We'll certainly come back to it in terms of your content. The other thing is, is thinking about the value of your content beyond acquisition. As, as I had been asked um, earlier by, by Kent around this idea of confusion, you can look at your customer buying process and see who else can benefit from this. So that your sales team, the same content you're doing for nurturing might be able to be repurposed to help your sales team nurture their database and their audience towards accelerating the pipeline. So this could be also used to nurture your existing customers. Um, it could be aligned for upsell, loyalty, and retention. Um, we, it could also be applied in your group around recruiting or training or customer service training and education. There's a lot of different ways. We're right now focused primarily on lead generation, but I just want you to know the benefit of this process it goes well beyond just helping us optimize the, the sales and marketing funnel. So you, we've talked about developing your foundational database, develop, designing your content library. You now need to look at is what I'm doing working? How do I measure and tweak the process? So as you tie your content to a specific conversion, your objective in sharing things from a nurturing point of view is looking at how do I measure what's working and what isn't. With a research chart, let's say you do it via webinar, you're going to look at things like how many registrants do we get, how many attendees, how many replays. A video clip, you'll measure things in a social standpoint based on views, likes, dislikes, and social shares. 
With a blog post, you're going to measure page views, comments, social shares, or with an email, uh, you're going to measure opens. Ultimately, the purpose of email is to get a click. So you'll measure click-throughs, and some of you may also have social aspects, so you measure it that way. Um, with a tactical tool download, this is something where they be coming to a landing page or to a form. So you'll look at the amount of downloads and how many leads you're capturing. The, the key thing in measuring conversion from a nurturing standpoint is that uh, going back to the foundational database, you're going to have a lot of different metrics. Um, this is where marketing automation can help you bring these metrics into one spot and being able to measure the level of engagement people have. We, we could spend an entire hour talking about lead scoring. Uh, I'm not going to focus on that today. But what I want to do is just say as you're measuring engagement, your goal is to understand what's the conversion? What's my objective in sharing this content? Um, when you're doing a simple nurturing process like I shared the case study earlier, they were sending emails. The emails were measured based on what people did with as a result of that email and the call to action, and then the, they use that to trigger what additional nurture path they'd put them in. So you just need to really be clear at how you're going to measure that, and you're going to do it two ways. Quantitative, so this is using your analytics to look at how you're driving engagement. You're also going to do it via form. So this is quantitative. Um, you know, did the form tie back to the database? How is the prospects engaged? and you're going to look for patterns. This is going to help you um, measure and make adjustments to know, well, this content's played well with our audience. We have a higher level engagement here. We've had more leads or inquiries come as a result of this. Then there's a qualitative side. And um, this is important as well because you're going to talk to your sales team. Their feedback to you is going to be qualitative as well. Um, comments of what people are making on your database based on blog post articles, what your sales team hears in terms of feedback from the prospect. So th this is going to help you bring these two pieces together. And ultimately what you need is to have tools that make it easy for you to understand the process. This is where um, lead nurturing automation tools, marketing automation tools, measuring um, the results. And there, there's a lot of different things you can do. And again, um, each of these areas I want to again equip you is I'm trying to put things in order in terms of understanding the foundational database, being able to put the, the pieces together to look at um, your content library, measuring and tweak. And then ultimately what you want to do is feed this back into your database to improve it um, and, and drive the conversation forward. So going back to the beginning, cycle back and prove your database. This is a real world example of showing the webinars, web inquiries, social media, all this coming into one place. Some of you don't have a system as I talked about. I've seen marketers do lead nurturing manually. They're doing it by bringing everything into Excel or into an access database so that they're able to measure the touch points. Uh, and it might look like this, you know, the path of they attended a workshop and they're going through a series of things from February um, through it, it started here as a contact page all the way to the steps that they went through through the process. And this helps you understand where John Smith is and how I can engage that. Um, something you're able to do as well as part of feeding data back in your database uh, is that think of the process as a series of microconversions. Uh, this is a sample of a group where they have in their database, they already know this information. So when they send an email to someone to have a, uh, a form to download that information, they're just asking for the data they don't know. And so instead of presenting this form, they're presenting a shorter, simpler form to help fill out the profile. So think of the micro-conversions that can take place in the process and feed that back into the system. And so um, as I said, I could spend an hour talking about lead scoring, but the it, at its gist, you're measuring uh, to, to really get to the core, what you're looking to do is measure things based on phone, email interactions, website visits, collateral downloads, event attendance, um, information requests. It, just know when people engage your content, it doesn't mean they're ready to talk to a salesperson. It doesn't mean that they're sales ready yet. 
what it means is that they were engaging that content. And your, your task is to understand um, two things. What question were they trying to answer? And how you can help progress that conversation forward. And so when someone downloads a white paper, you're not going to um, call them and assume they're ready to be sales ready. I've seen, I, I won't name the company, but I, I downloaded a, a white paper. I got called by a sales rep. The sales rep wanted to qualify I was ready for the demo. I was really just looking to research the issue, and the white paper answered some of the questions. So what I suggested to this person is saying, instead of calling me in this level, and this is what, what we've tested, is to be able to instead say, hey, I saw you downloaded our white paper, and a lot of people who download it are trying to answer questions for themselves or someone else in their company. What was the question you're trying to answer? Um, so I, I can provide information to you that would be relevant. What, how can I help? And then moving to qualification. The, the other way is, is let's say someone attended a webinar. Um, giving and equipping your sales team to have a follow-up content piece that extends the value of that webinar. So rather than following up to a webinar attendee and saying, I saw you attended a webinar and move immediately to qualification, it can be that same thing. I saw you registered for a webinar. It looks uh, like you had a chance to attend it. I wanted to get your thoughts. Was it helpful to you? Did it answer your questions? And then for that sales rep, give them a valid business reason to connect, saying a lot of people who attended our webinar um, were looking for some key takeaways. And what we did is we put together an executive summary of the, of the big takeaways for the webinar. I just wanted to pass along to you. And the goal, again, is to have every touch be adding value. Um, something that's not in my notes, but I just want to say, how do you know when you're nurturing? How do you know if you're doing a good job re-engaging your leads? Is um, to do this. Is the content you're sharing with your potential customer valuable even if they never buy from you? And if the answer is yes, you're doing nurturing. If not, you really need to investigate and, and make a decision. Are you sharing content at the, at the right time with that person? Or are you trying to present information that's too far along and they aren't ready to engage that yet? So we've talked about four key steps. And the, the key idea here is you need to pull together building your database and your universal lead definition. And then from there having a content strategy to progress people. And so we talked about developing a foundational database, designing your content library, measuring a tweak, and then improving that. And I wanted to leave you with some takeaways. So here's your action items. Number one, you need to determine your universal lead definition. Let's say you have one. If you haven't revised it with your team and closed the loop, I can guarantee you that you're probably not giving your team exactly what they want. And I would encourage you to go back and revisit your universal lead definition to make adjustments. It's an iterative process, and it requires feedback for you to make those improvements. Number two, before you begin nurturing, uh, build a three-month track for your top three personas. What I'm saying here is I find too many marketers develop the first touch, and then they're scrambling in month two to figure out what else they want to say. So what I want you to do is think at least three steps ahead. This is going to help you be proactive so you don't wonder what are we going to talk about next. And this is going to help you be consistent in the process because what we talked about is lead nurturing is having an ongoing, meaningful conversation with viable potential customers regardless of their timing to buy. The third step is you can take one content piece and look at how you can extend that into four. So your takeaway here is I want you to look at your current content and ask yourself, how can I extend the value of my most valuable content? So you're not creating new stuff. You're looking at how do you go further with what you already have. And as part of this, when you're sharing the information, as you share it, track the, the objectives and set goals to increase them. Right now, there's a lot of metrics there. People ask me, well, how am I doing versus my competitors? And the question really you should be asking yourself is, how well is my content resonating with my audience to drive better engagement? Focus on that and make steps 
in, to improve the level of engagement with your content, with your audience. That really is your objective. Fifth, you need to take this touch points. We call them touch points. Some call it digital body language. Others are going to call it um, engagement or uh, meaningful moments. Whatever term you use, we'll, we'll call it touch points is you need to bring all this data into one spot so you can understand how your audience is engaging your content and profiling that. And um, the, the last and not least is I wanted to share some resources with you. We're going to move to Q&A. And I wanted to um, let you guys start thinking about questions that you have. I certainly have some common questions that people are bringing up. But I would encourage you, you can visit um, the B2B lead blog. And that blog, we literally have hundreds of articles. It's all how-to. There's a search engine there. So if you have questions on how to build a universal lead definition, type that into the search engine. Um, I also want to encourage you to look at the uh, B2B lead roundtable. We have uh, over 11,000 professionals who, it, uh, who are connected together online via LinkedIn. And this is a place for you to connect with your peers. I started this group as an experiment just as a way to learn and have um, marketers network and understand. And what I love about this group is I'm constantly learning from the comments of, of the group. Our, our role we mainly just moderate it. If you aren't a member, I'd encourage you to, to look at that. And I know that ReadyTalk has an ongoing series that they're presenting as well. So um, thank you for, for having me. We're going to move and, and use this time for Q&A. I certainly see some that's come through. And Simone, I'm going to go ahead and hand back to you. Thanks for having me. I hope you found this uh, content useful and, and helpful. And I look forward to hearing about your success as a result of what you learned today. Sure. So I will uh, queue up a couple of the questions here. One is, um, you know, do you have any research on the impact of mixing business development calls with an email nurturing campaign? And you know, maybe give us a few pointers on have you seen that be successful? Not a good approach. Oh, definitely. In fact, uh, we actually published a case study on uh, marketing Sherpa of a company that simply combined email with, uh, with doing follow-up teleprospecting calls and drove a 300% increase in their number of sales-ready lead conversions. So um, what, the, the answer to the question is yes. If you have an inside sales team or you have a business development team doing two things, combining the phone and email together, and what this company did um, is that they, they had their inside sales team. They would send an email. Based on what people did with that content, uh, if they engaged it, they had a follow-up email piece for their business development rep to share with someone. And uh, what, what happened as a result, and I'm just looking up the, the company name as we speak, is that they were able to drive 300% um, more ROA from combining email and the phone together. And this event, um, if, if you guys uh, want to jot this down, go to Marketing Sherpa. It's case study 32177. And it has steps and how to and the and the creative that was used for this. So the bottom line is is that it it does work to combine that. And by doing so, they saw 40% more appointments, and 82% um, of the appointments were generated from a follow-up phone call instead of email. Uh, so it was email that showed where the human touch should be prioritized. Great, thank you. So hopefully that kind of helped uh, answer your question there, Jennifer. Um, another question too, and hopefully I phrased this right, and uh, Jennifer, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. But um, how do you get the contact? Um, excuse me. How do you get the opt-in contact info for three personas per company? And I'm not I sure. Would, if, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, as I understand it, I would start this. Uh, two things. I would start looking at your customer database. And, uh, and understanding who the contacts were in the buying process. So look at the recent closes that have happened or the recent wins, uh, the, the 10 most recent wins in your database. And um, you can find this in your CRM or Contact Manager and see who the titles are that were in the process. Uh, the second thing and the, is sitting down with your sales team to talk through who are the key drivers in the buying process for what we sell. So you want to take the quantitative data, looking at what, what your data shows, 
and bringing the qualitative of talking with your sales team. And, and I'm a big believer that the more frequently sales and marketing are huddling up, um, the, the better the ROI is going to be for your lead gen because you're going to just be a lot better aligned. Good. I'm glad you were able to answer that better than I was probably able to state it. So, <laughs> uh, Thanks, Brian. So um, I'm going to give you guys a couple more minutes here to chat in any additional questions um, that you might have. Again, look at Brian's contact information there. If you happen to have additional questions or you think of something after you jump off the call, which always is usually what happens to me, um, he's given some great resources. I'd be sure to check out um, some of these links that he's uh, provided here, and we can also include that um, in the post-event email. Um, in addition to that, um, we partner with, uh, with Mech Labs and Marketing Sherpas on this webinar series. And like Brian said, um, we've got another one coming up in the fall and a previous one that we did just a couple months ago. You can find all those recording on our uh, readytalk.com uh, website under the webinar section. And uh, just a special offer to you today of, of partnering with Mech Labs if you guys are curious about um, you know, ReadyTalk services or, or similar um, webinars series that, you know, that we've done with Mech Labs. Um, if you guys are interested in a free trial um, or a demo and just chat yes into the chat feature, we are happy to pass along um, a copy of Brian's book, Lead Generation for the Complex Sale. Um, we'll be sure to have someone follow up with you right away. Um, it looks like Kent had an additional question here. And he says, uh, I sense that most cold call techniques go by the wayside um, with some of these campaigns. What's your insight or feedback on that, Brian? Well, Kent, that I, I think that um, there's definitely truth in that the cold call techniques would go by the wayside, the traditional. But uh, what we found is, is uh, serving B2B buyers, uh, Marketing Sherpa did a study of, of just business to business buyers. And one of the questions we asked him is, is, are you receptive to receiving cold calls? I think you'd be shocked by uh, what the response was. 92% of business to business buyers said, yes, they would be receptive to a cold call as long as it's relevant. And what I've been teaching today really is when we look at content, when we talk about building personas, putting together message maps, is messaging in a relevant way. And so what you need to understand when you're engaging someone is, especially when you do a re lead re-engagement, someone who hasn't heard from your company, and let's say it's a lead that was generated in January, handed off to the sales team, and for all intents and purposes it was ignored. They haven't heard anything from your company. You know, you need to look at how do you re-engage them, and the question is, is what's a relevant way to do that? That's where that research um, and, and understanding your audience is going to be really helpful. So um, traditional cold calling techniques are, are um, going to go by the wayside, which is making irrelevant calls. And this is the question every B2B buyer asks, is this person or company relevant to me? or to someone else in my company. And this is where researching, understanding, being clear on your value proposition, understanding the, the hot button issues, and using content um, as a valid business reason to connect with someone. So your goal isn't to necessarily pitch them. It really is instead of looking to close for a lead, it's looking at how you can help. And so um, someone, uh, I, I did a webinar with uh, um, John Miller, uh, a while ago, and, and he said the quote, you know, moving from always be closing to always being helping. And I agree 100% with that. So uh, traditional techniques are by the wayside, but people are receptive to cold calls as long as you're looking to be relevant and, and help them. Great. So uh, Kent, hopefully that's helpful as well. And um, we've definitely followed a lot of Brian's <laughs> tactics and suggestions here with our own um, sales and marketing ops at ReadyTalk, and uh, definitely found the, the benefit in that cold call piece, even though sometimes it doesn't seem like it might be all that relevant, but um, a good tip there for sure just from experience. So um, any closing comments from you, Brian, before we jump off of today's call? I just want to say thanks to everyone. Again, I wasn't there. I hope you found value in, in today's session, and, and we're here to help. So if you have questions, you can uh, certainly email me. Yeah, you can Twitter. 
Um, if I can help you directly, I'll connect with members of your team. And, and I want to thank uh, Simone and ReadyTalk for uh, bringing this content to you today. You bet, and we uh, really appreciate you taking some time out of your day also to, to join us. Again, as a reminder, everybody, you are going to get that post-event email with um, the PDF of the slide deck and the recording link here. Just look for that later on this afternoon. Um, obviously, we'd also love your feedback. Um, so as soon as I quit talking here, I'll stop the meeting and a post-event survey would pop up. We'd love to hear what you have to say about the event, and uh, hopefully you do join us again for another event on our series. So thank you everybody. Thank you Brian, and have a fantastic day.